Today, Monday, 15th April, we wait to see what, if any, action Israel takes in response to the missile strike that Iran conducted against Israel over the course of the weekend. And there's been, it must be said, a pile-up of pressure on Israel from allies of the United States and from the United States itself to desist from taking any further direct action against Iran. The United States has made it fairly clear that it would not want to see such action taken. President Biden convened a meeting of G7 leaders. There was a lot of debate and discussion as to why that particular format was chosen. Why, since this is a military crisis, for example, the United States did not seek a meeting of NATO leaders instead? Well, the short answer, of course, is that the United States does not, for the moment, want to escalate or militarise this crisis further. What it is seeking to do is to increase pressure on Israel and the G7 format, which brings together the United States' core allies, is the most effective way of doing that. So we have seen the pressure on Israel mount. Now Israel itself has been involved in, I suspect, difficult discussions as to what exactly to do. There have been meetings of the Israeli War Cabinet. We had a report yesterday that directly after the telephone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu, Netanyahu called off a counter-strike that Israel had prepared against Iran. But clearly there's been dissension within the Israeli War Cabinet. Uh, Defence Minister Glantz apparently wants to take a strong line. <laughs> Uh, um, others want to take uh, um, a softer line. Um, it's unclear as of the present time exactly what Israel is intending to do. There has been a statement, I'm not sure from what, how authoritative this statement is, but it appears to come from Israel, saying that Israel will be taking simultaneously <laughs> offensive and defensive actions in light of what happened over the weekend, the Iranian strike over the weekend. And very belatedly, the UN Security Council has now met. The Iranians wanted a meeting of the Security Council before, after the attack on their embassy building in Damascus. The Western powers apparently blocked it. Uh, but now, of course, that there has been the Iranian strike on Israel, a Security Council meeting is taking place where the Russian ambassador, Vasily Nebenzia, has criticised the failure of the Security Council to meet prior to the um, Iranian attack on Israel, but after the Israeli attack on the embassy in Damascus. So anyway, that's the situation at the present time. We're all waiting to see what, if anything, the Israelis are going to do. Some kind of Israeli response, I think, is inevitable. It would be a complete change in Israeli behaviour if, after being on the receiving end on, of a missile strike from Iran, they simply folded their hands and did nothing. So some kind of Israeli response is inevitable. The question is, what form is it going to take? Is it going to be in the form of attacks on Iranian allies in the Middle East? The usual bombing attacks on Hezbollah and on other Iranian allies, the Houthis maybe, the Iraqis. Iraqi militias, or will Israel take the plunge and launch some kind of a strike on Iran itself? 
Anyway, we will have to see. Apparently, American officials are giving reassurances to the media that the Israelis are assuring them that whatever action Israel does take, <clears throat> it will be measured and will not be intended to escalate the situation. However, as I've said in previous programs, Israel remains the wild card. The Americans and the Iranians clearly came to some kind of an understanding before the Iranian strike on Israel took place. The Financial Times alerted us to the fact in advance with its article, which I have discussed many times, discussions to take place between Iran and the United States um, through the meet with Oman acting as the intermediary, the Iranians assuring the Americans they did not want an uncontrolled escalation in the situation in the Middle East. They were not looking for a general war. The United States reassuring the Iranians that the United States also did not want an uncontrolled escalation of the situation in the Middle East. It, too, is not seeking a war. The Iranians promising or telling the Americans that their attack on Israel would be measured. The is Iranians today, by the way, have gone further and they've said that the, they gave the Americans and others 74 hours warning before the strike took place. American officials are denying this fact, but if we go back to the Financial Times article, which I discussed, the one that appeared some days ago, I said when I analysed that article in a video that I did, I think it was on Friday or Saturday, that in fact it was pretty clear, reading that article, that the Iranians had in fact given the Americans a fairly detailed picture of what the strike on Israel was going to be. So on this, on this particular question about whether Iran did give prior warning to the United States about the nature and extent of its strike, based on the Financial Times article, I tend to believe Iran. Anyway, um, we will see what happens. I think before we proceed, it is important to restate the essential facts about the current conflict, not between Israel and Iran, but between Iran and the United States. Now, the United States at the present time is, as I've discussed in many programs, massively overextended. It is committed to supporting Ukraine in a war where, which Ukraine is losing and where Ukraine is desperately short of military uh, equipment, military material, and is pleading with the United States for more, more than the United States can provide. The United States is tied down with all kinds of conflicts across the Middle East, it's got much of its fleet sailing rather aimlessly around the Red Sea, trying and failing to prevent strikes from the Houthis. It's got potential conflicts with China in Taiwan, South China Sea, and in other places in the Indo-Pacific region. The United States has had a history of unsuccessful wars, going all the way back to 2001 with the invasion of Afghanistan, which took place in the aftermath of the 9-11 events. Those unsuccessful wars have principally played out, it should be remembered, in the Middle East itself. The United States also finds that it could be following the conflict in Ukraine, in a long-term conflict with a resurgent Russia. 
it's of course already in conflict with an increasingly powerful China and the US economy itself is showing many signs of overextension. It's adding a trillion dollars in debt every three months. And it's also seeing its inflation rate tick upwards. The United States at this present time needs another war in the Middle East like a hole in the head. Even the Biden administration understands this. And for the Biden administration, this is an even more urgent issue because they have an election to win in November and they know perfectly well that the last thing the American public wants is for the United States to be dragged in to another forever war, this time against Iran. So the United States, at this time at least, is logically not needing a war with Iran. There are advocates of that war in the United States. There are many such advocates, in fact. There are advocates of such a war in the administration itself. I have gained the impression, as many others have done, that the president himself has at times not been averse to the idea, shall I put it in that way, of having some kind of major conflict with Iran. But logically, all the facts at this moment in time, this precise moment in time, argue against it. On the Iranian side, Iran has, in 2023, experienced what some might call a miracle year. After decades of isolation, after decades of conflict with Saudi Arabia, it has, mediate, it has succeeded, as a result of Chinese mediation, in re-establishing at least cordial relations with Saudi Arabia. It has joined the BRICS states. It is starting to see trade restrictions imposed upon it lifted. There has been a resumption of trade with countries like China and India and Russia. Its economy is beginning to boom with growth rate in excess of 7%. And it has been the beneficiary, if that is the last right word, of a major arms deal with Russia, and apparently already Yak-130 um, trainers and ground attack aircraft are arriving in Iran. All of that would be placed in jeopardy if Iran were to find itself locked in a war with the United States and Israel in the Middle East, countries which, of course, are far more powerful than is Iran itself. The Iranians also have very strong reasons at this time not to seek a war. So that gives both the Americans and the Iranians a reason to come to an understanding. The Financial Times, before the Iranian strike on Israel, effectively told us that they had and everything that has happened since that article was written, the way the missile strike by Iran played out, the fact that it appears to have been only directed at military targets, the fact that there seems to have been an effort made to avoid causing civilian casualties, the fact that despite the denials, it does seem as if Iran did forewarn the United States, and by extension Israel, that the attack was coming, and the fact that the United States, since that attack, has been pressing Israel and has got its allies also to press Israel to try to moderate their response, to avoid countering Iran in a fierce and strong way, which might Iran might feel 
it had no choice but to respond to in turn. All of that suggests to us that the Americans and the Iranians currently are following their interests and have indeed reached an understanding and are trying to bring some limits to this situation. So that gives us some hope that this will hold. Hope, but obviously not certainty. A lot will depend on how the discussions and decisions play out in Israel itself. Now, there's been some discussion about Israeli motivations over the last few weeks. I read an interesting article in The Guardian which said that the Israeli attack on the embassy building in Damascus was a serious mistake, but it put down this mistake, as it was described, to the product of chaotic decision-making within Israel itself. Apparently, information that Iran, that Israel received that these senior Iranian officials were coming together to hold this meeting in this embassy created a temptation to launch a strike and take out these senior Iranian officials. And this was a temptation that the Israeli military and security apparatus could not bring itself to resist. So this is all supposedly a mistake there was no calculation, no plan to provoke Iran, no thought that a mere attack on an embassy building would provoke Iran in the way that it did, and that the Israelis themselves have supposedly been taken by surprise by the strength of the Iranian reaction. I'm going to say straight away that I do not believe that theory. I think that an attack on an embassy building is a very serious matter indeed. I think it is inconceivable that it would have happened without author authorization from Prime Minister Netanyahu himself. I'm confident, given Prime Minister Netanyahu's own difficult position, that he will have consulted members of his own war cabinet before making a decision like that. And I am sure that at the back of Prime Minister Netanyahu's mind, perhaps at the back and at the forefront of his mind, and perhaps also discussed with the other members of the War Cabinet, there was the idea of launching a strike which would provoke Iran and which would lead to a wider war, one involving the United States and Iran. And there are compelling reasons why the Israelis might be thinking in that way. They have seen signs that Western support for Israel in its conflict in Gaza is starting to ebb away. There was that vote in the Security Council a few weeks ago where the Security Council demanded an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, leading to a long and sustainable ceasefire uh, going forward. There's been criticisms of the conduct of the war in Gaza increasingly from the United States. And there has also been criticism of the conduct of the war in Gaza within Israel itself. Now, in saying this, I want to make it clear that criticism of the Gaza war in Gaza probably remains a minority. Uh, something that is confined to a minority. But we are starting to get articles like this. Now, this article is in Haaretz, a liberal newspaper by I Israeli standards, one very critical of Prime Minister Netanyahu. But articles like this are appearing. And this is an article that came out on the 11th of April, written by Chaim Levinson. And it says, saying what can't be said, Israel has been defeated, a total defeat. The, war, the war's aims won't be achieved. The hostages won't be returned through military pressure. Security won't be restored. And Israel's international ostracism 
won't end. We've lost. Truth must be told. The, admit, the inability to admit it encapsulates everything you need to know about Israel's individual and mass psychology. There is a clear, sharp, predictable reality that we should begin to fathom, to process, to understand, and to draw conclusions from for the future. It's no fun to admit that we've lost, so we lie to ourselves. Now, I have to say, whatever you may think of this article, and I will say that I found much of it somewhat confused, but of course the opening part is direct and very much to the point. Whatever you may think of this article, whatever you may think of Haaretz, and I do understand, as I said, that many people in Israel don't subscribe to Haaretz and its left-of-centre philosophy. Well, I think it'd be all but inconceivable that an article as strong and as forthright as this could appear in any number of European countries discussing the conflict in Gaza, um, written in this way. I think it is most unlikely that an article of this kind would appear in Germany at the present time, for example. Just by way of, example, just by way of illustration, um, the former Greek finance minister, the economist Yanis Varoufakis, apparently was scheduled to attend an anti-war conference in Berlin. He was going to make various criticisms of the conflict in Gaza there. He made went to extraordinary lengths in his published statements to make it clear that his conflict, his criticisms were of the war and of Israeli policy and did not extend beyond that and certainly didn't encompass the Jewish people in any sort of way. And his criticisms of the war and of the outcome of the war actually, in my opinion, in some respects, at least, fall short of this article in Haaretz by Chaim Levinson. Yet I understand that the German Interior Ministry has told, them, has told him that he cannot attend this conference in Germany, and I, from what I understand, I might be wrong about this, he is essentially barred from going to Germany altogether. So, in Israel, they're able to talk and discuss and argue about the conflict in Gaza to an extent that in many places, other places, we cannot do. But anyway, put aside what you think of Haaretz. Maybe make your criticisms, if you wish, of this article. But the comments, the key comments that are being made in this article are apparently becoming increasingly widely shared within Israel itself. Political figures like Avigdor Lieberman, most emphatically not liberal or centre-left or anything like that. Prominent Israeli politician, I believe he's been defence minister in the past. He has come out and he's made criticisms of the conduct of the war in Gaza, which are not entirely removed from those that Chaim Levinson is making in this article in Haaretz. And the simple, straightforward point is that six months after the Israeli military campaign in Gaza began, victory over Hamas, victory which Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government have defined as the destruction of um, Hamas is proving all but impossible to achieve at any cost that the world would accept in terms of the already catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza. The result being that Israel, with its economy in a tailspin, with its army overextended, with its forces in crisis, um, is having to pull back most of its troops from Gaza. And though there's still talk about an offensive against Rafa, an offensive which might eventually 
happen. It's clear that much of the conviction has drained away from the Gaza enterprise in Israel itself. And of course, all the points that Levinson makes about Israel facing isolation, criticism around the world for its conflict in Gaza is absolutely true. And the trend of voting in the UN confirms as much. The change in the political atmosphere in Europe confirms it too. The problems that President Biden is having in places like Michigan confirms it also. So, given that that is so, I personally have no doubt whatsoever that one of the reasons, in fact the reason, for the attack by the Israelis on the embassy building in Damascus was precisely to create the conflict in the Middle East between the Israel and Iran and ultimately between Iran and the United States, which would in some way perhaps distract attention from the failure in Gaza and perhaps just possibly even reverse that failure. Well, if so, Netanyahu, as people who are often under extreme pressure, find miscalculated. He didn't understand the growing pressures on the United States, the regional pressures in the Middle East, the domestic pressures that he has, that the United States, the administration is experiencing. And what he has now learned is that the United States does not want, is not keen of becoming involved in an all-out conflict with Iran. Now, how that is going to affect his decisions, how that is going to affect the cabinet's decisions in Jerusalem, as I said, remains to be seen. Now, one further point I'm going to make, and it we come back to a discussion of the effectiveness of that Iranian strike on Israel. Given everything that we've heard, given everything that the Iranians themselves have said, given what we learned from that article in the Financial Times, given the way in which the US and its allies are responding to the Iranian missile strike, it is clear that the Iranians pulled their punches, that they carried out a missile strike on Iran because they had no real choice. They had to reassure their allies that their resolve was unshaken. They had to demonstrate to the Israelis that there are limits and attacks on embassy buildings are unacceptable. But nonetheless, they pulled their punches. They didn't engage in an all-out missile war against Israel. They did demonstrate, undoubtedly, that they have a certain ability to engage in such a missile war if the need arises. There's been a vast amount of discussion, claims, boasts, bragging about how many Iranian missiles and how many Iranian cruise missiles and how many Iranian drones were shot down. The cost of that success at $1.3 billion seems to me to be enormous and, as I've said previously, if not unrepeatable, then at least unsustainable over the duration of a long missile campaign. I've seen one estimate, by the way, that the Iranian attack might have cost Iran something like $30 million. I don't believe that. I think it must have cost more than that. But anyway, that perhaps gives us some idea of the disproportion in resources that between the resources Iran committed to the missile attack and the resources the Israelis and their allies 
had to commit to parry it. And beyond that, it does seem as if the Iranians were, whether with hypersonic missiles, operating hypersonic light vehicles, or with missiles operating marved vehicles, or whatever, it does seem as if the Iranians did manage to strike at their two prime designated targets. The two air bases, which they now say, rightly or wrongly, were the air bases from which the aircraft that carried out the strike on their embassy are based. That may be true, that may not be true, I don't know. And, well, there's also claims that they successfully struck a building which supposedly houses an intelligence um, uh, a, part, um, a section of Israel's intelligence community, the part of Israel's intelligence community that was in some way involved also, allegedly, in the strike on that on the Iranian embassy. About the intelligence, the strike on the intelligence building and whether it actually happened and what damage it did, I'm going to say straight away, I am not particularly well informed. It hasn't received much attention. About the successful, or at least the success of some Iranian missiles in reaching their targets in the two air bases, that is not disputed. And there are satellite pictures now which confirm the fact. So, the Iranians have done what I think they wanted to do. They've demonstrated resolve, they've demonstrated reach, they've demonstrated capability, even as they pulled their punches and told the United States in advance that that was what they were going to do in order to avoid escalation. So... The United States, which obviously knows all that, and which obviously has a much more accurate and complete picture about what really happened over the course of those Iranian missile strikes than we do, it knows how many and of what sort Iranian missiles reach those air bases and what kind of capability those missiles actually have. Well... The United States clearly understands that a conflict with Iran would both be prolonged and would come with a significant cost, and it doesn't want to find itself there. Now, there is one further point that I do want to just briefly touch on, and um, it flows from my discussion about... Um, the capabilities of some of these Iranian missiles and uh, whether or not these missiles might have hypersonic glide capabilities, uh, uh, glide vehicle capabilities or not, or whatever. And I suggested yesterday that it did seem to me as if the Iranians would probably not have the means to develop such capabilities, if they exist. I don't know for a fact that they do uh, by themselves, and that they would probably have needed help, either from the Russians or from the Chinese or from both, in order to achieve it. Well, shortly after I made my programme yesterday, um, somebody, a member of the community, sent me um, an email with a photograph of a North Korean ballistic missile, uh, one which um, I admit I had missed it was made apparently earlier this month on the 2nd of April and it shows that this North Korean missile appears to have something that looks very much like a hypersonic glide vehicle warhead. Apparently it's the Hwasong 16B. <laughs> so the North Koreans do appear to have something like this kind of capability. Yes, of course, it's a mock-up, which it might be. But anyway, for what it's worth, we have a picture of a North Korean missile with a hypersonic or glide vehicle, or what looks to me like a glide vehicle. 
Now, there's a very long history of very close relations between Iran and North Korea, going all the way back to the 1980s, to the Iran-Iraq war. The North Koreans, for their part, have apparently uh, um, acquired submarine technology from Iran. I suppose it's possible that I Iran obtained help with its missile program from North Korea. How the North Koreans were able to develop such a vehicle, such a system, if they really have, and if this isn't just a mock-up, well, that's another question which I'm not going to discuss in this program. Again, all sorts of possibilities arise, which I'm not going to uh, spend time in this program seeking to explore. Anyway, there we are. Um, we wait to see what the Israelis are going to do. I'm not a betting man at any time with the Israelis anyway. One can never be certain that they will at any point in time act with restraint. Unusual for them to do so, in fact. But if I had to make a guess, I would guess that the pressure from the United States, from the US's European allies, from some, at least, I'm guessing, of Israel's friends in the United States, for Israel itself to pull its punches in response to this Iranian attack so that some kind of fragile peace in the Middle East can be preserved. I would, on balance, guess that that will be enough and that the most dangerous moment in this crisis has passed. I might be completely wrong about this. We'll just have to wait and see. Anyway, that's what I'm going to say about this affair up to this point. For the record, and just one very last observation, many are saying that um, Israel has achieved a clear-cut victory um, in this affair up to now. President Biden is apparently telling Prime Minister Netanyahu that given that this is what has happened, that's another reason for Israel not to escalate further. I would not agree with that view. I would say that if we do manage to draw even a jagged line under this affair at this point, then overall, the winner on points is Iran, in the sense that they will have made their point without allowing themselves to be dragged into an open-ended conflict with Israel and the United States, which it is clear they do not want. Anyway, let's move on. And let's turn to that other big conflict in the world, the one in Ukraine. Now, there's been three very interesting developments over the last 24 hours. And I'm going to go firstly to the one that's come up, come from a apparently casual comment in the latest bulletin update provided by the Russian Ministry of Defense. It's attracted a lot of interest and attention in the various telegram channels and reporting places, and it's been picked up by some people on Twitter X, and I do think it is an important revelation. And briefly, it is this. Um, the Russian Defence Ministry, in its report, its daily summary of the events of the previous of, of, of the day, which it published late yesterday, it started with these words: "The armed forces of the Russian Federation continue the special military operation in Belgorod direction." Units of the Sever, that's the North Group of Forces, supported by aviation and artillery, 
hit enemy manpower and hardware near Ternovaya, Gatishche, Kharkiv region, and Radyanskoye, Sumy region. The enemy lost up to 60 Ukrainian troops, four motor vehicles, one 155mm made M109 Paladin self-propelled artillery system, and one Norta electronic warfare station. That is how the yesterday's update from the Russian Defence Ministry starts. Now, that's an unusually brief statement. I mean, it's giving us some information about some bombing and shelling of Ukrainian positions in Kharkov region, which is nothing new. But it's also disclosing the existence of two new things. It tells us that there is now a Belgorod direction, in other words, a theatre of operations centred on the Russian town of Belgorod. And there is now a new group of forces, a new army group, in other words, that has been concentrated in this area, the Sever group of forces, Army Group North, if you like. Now, up to now, no such group of forces, the Sever Army Group, has been um, revealed or has been mentioned in any previous Russian Defence Ministry update. So the Russians have now, in this quiet way, announced the creation and formation of an entirely new group of forces in the north, the far northern section of the conflict line, in Kharkov region, specifically tasked apparently with operations in Kharkov region, based in Belgorod, and this new group of forces is the Sever or North group of forces. Now, we're not told how many military units compose these, this group of forces, how many brigades and divisions, who the commander is. The Russian Ministry of Defence never gives out that kind of information. But a group of forces does usually bring together a significant number of men and machines. I would guess... The minimum number would be twenty to 30,000. Uh, a more typical number would be upward of 100,000. So a group of forces has been created. It's still apparently based in Russia, in Belgorod, but its area of responsibility appears to be Kharkov region and Kharkov itself. Now, entirely predictably, many people, Dima, for example, at the Ministry Military Summary Channel, but others also, are seeing this as evidence that the Russians are putting together forces in Belgorod region in preparation for a offensive into Kharkov region, perhaps one intending to capture Kharkov city itself, but also, doubtless, to establish this buffer zone in Kharkov region that President Putin has been talking about. Now that, of course, is quite likely, and it is consistent with what Putin is saying, and it is consistent with the many reports and rumours that we have had about the Russians launching some offensive at some point in Kharkov region, and that this might be the main focus of their offensive but, I have to say, and I have to add this word of caution, mere announcement that there's a new direction and that a new group of forces has been created to cover it does not itself amount to an announcement of an offensive. So we'll just need to wait and see what this new force that's been put together is intending to do. More likely than not, as I've said, it will be taking the offensive some time, maybe next month, 
maybe in the summer. Maybe its plan is to take capture Kharkov. The constant Russian attacks on Kharkov, the fact that Kharkov now has to put it mildly erratic power supplies um, and that many of its people have apparently evacuated from it. All of that is consistent with the Russians planning an offensive intended to capture it. But, as I said, we mustn't run too far ahead of ourselves. We must wait and see. Difficult, though that sometimes is to do. Elsewhere on the front lines, things continue to take a very dramatic turn. And the major events now seem to be centering, at least the most dramatic events seem to be centering, or at least the most dramatic news is now centering on Chasov Yar. To reiterate again, Sirsky, the military commander of the Ukrainian forces, has spoken about a very grave situation on the battlefronts. He's admitted that the situation in Chasov Yar is particularly bad. He says that the Russians are planning to capture Chasov Yar by the 9th of May. And I've already said that I think it is all but inconceivable that the Russians have boxed themselves in with such a timetable based on the political calendar. But that there is an operational crisis for the Ukrainians in Chasov Yar, that is indisputable. Now, as we know, the Russians have captured Bogdanovka. The Ukrainians have admitted as much, even though the Russian Defense Ministry, as I recall, has not yet said so. And the Russians have also um, managed to um, bypass, outflank Chasov Yar from the north and are apparently in the process of conducting an operation that looks as if it might be at least in part intended to encircle at least the micro district west uh, east sorry of the canal um, and perhaps also gain positions which could be used to launch a wider offensive against um, Chasov Yar itself. There's also many reports that the Russians are pressing on this hill southwest of Bogdanovka, that they're uh, either approaching Kalinina or are working towards doing so. Um, anyway, there's been lots of reports of this kind. But one thing does seem to be generally acknowledged is that the communications, the transport links, the supply routes between the micro district of Chasov Yar, east of the Chasov Yar Canal, and the main town of Chasov Yar, west of the canal, that transport link is now continuously covered by Russian drones and artillery and aircraft, making it extremely perilous for Ukrainian troops to move along it, either heading towards Chasov Yar or retreating from it. And to get a sense of how bad the situation in Chasov Yar has now become, there are reports that the 3rd Assault Brigade, the Azov Brigade, in other words, the reconstituted Azov Brigade, has straightforwardly refused orders from Sirsky and the Ukrainian High Command to redeploy to Chasov Yar. Um, they apparently have all but recognised that this town is lost. They are becoming, by the way, increasingly insubordinate. They um, show themselves to be something of a law unto themselves in the fighting in Avdevka. And if the reports are to be believed, they're also refusing to go to Chasov Yar. And there were reports, I have seen reports, Dima again at the Military Summary Channel touched on them, that the Russians are now um, dropping leaflets and circulating messages, radioing messages to the Ukrainian troops in the micro district, telling them that the Ukrainian military has to all intents abandoned them, that lines of retreat have been closed off, that their best 
and indeed only prospect of life, is to surrender. And it may very come, very well come to that. Um, some are talking about a cauldron, others are talking about an operational encirclement. There were reports this morning that the Russians have captured more positions within the micro district. Anyway, it does look as if the situation in the micro district is becoming critical. And, well, we'll see what the Ukrainian troops there do decide to do. There are lots of claims, again, that Sirsky, perhaps becoming nervous about the reluctance of the troops in the micro district to follow orders, that he's been sacking their officers and replacing them with other officers who he hopes will continue to lead these troops or persuade these troops to continue fighting. We'll see. But anyway, um, it does look as if the situation in Chasufyar is now very bad indeed. And of course, I'm focusing here on the micro district. If Kalinina has indeed fallen or is likely to fall or is likely to be attacked and is captured before long, then of course, the route is open apparently for the Russians to cross the canal and attack the main part of Chasov Yar from the north. And as I've discussed in recent programs, the Russians advancing from Ivanivska appear to be doing the same thing from the south. It does look as if Chasov Yar is being taken into pincers. The Russians in the micro district, the troops in the micro district, effectively encircled. The Russians bombing Chasov Yar relentlessly. The Russian air force operating above it all the time. As I said, the situation in Chasov Yar looks all but def desperate. To reiterate again, if Chasov Yar falls, it is a very bad situation for Ukraine. It opens the way to Konstantinovka, much bigger town, around 60,000 people to the southwest. Konstantinovka is apparently where the Ukrainian headquarters in the area has been relocated. Konstantinovka, though it is a bigger place than Chasov Yar, is on lower ground than Chasov Yar. It's probably undefendable if Chasov Yar itself falls. If the Russians capture Konstantinovka, the next big place is Kramatorsk. And beyond Kramatorsk, it's basically an open road to the Dnieper. So an important battle playing out in Chasov Yar. And of course, if Chasov Yar does indeed fall, the crisis for the Ukrainians psychologically as well, another fortified town effectively captured. So a bad situation for the Ukrainians in Chasov Yar. In fact, a dramatically bad situation for the Ukrainians in Chasov Yar. In Avdevka, in the Avdevka area, the situation is, if possible, even worse and becoming more dangerous still. Now, I spoke about how the Russians appear to be advancing north of Abdevka, up the railway towards Ocheretinje. I've also said that they appear to have reached this settled area along the railway. I had thought, by the way, that this was probably the village of, Novach, of Novo Bakhmutivka. I now understand that Novo, Novo Bakhmutivka is an area, is a village to the west of this inhabited area, but away from the railway. We'll come to Novo Bakhmutivka in a moment. Apparently, this inhabited area on the railway is another Dacha settlement. These are country houses, small log cabins, quite often, but anyway, um, summer homes that many people in the Soviet Union and today in Russia and in Ukraine like to build. They're not in any sense permanent places of permanent residence. People tend to go to them, their second homes, 
which people go to when they want to relax on weekends or during the holidays. And apparently this is a Dacha settlement like that. So we're not talking about big structures, buildings, uh, certainly no big high-rise residential complexes which can be turned into fortresses, but rather wooded, wooden buildings and brick buildings and things of that kind. And it seems that the Russians have entered this Dacha district, apparently. It's called the Zarya um, Dacha district and are in the process of clearing the Ukrainian troops there. And of course, if they do, that puts them in a strong position to advance further north towards Ocheretinje, which would in that case be the one remaining Ukrainian position north of Russian positions on the railway. And of course, if the Russians capture Ocheretinje, they gain the high ground. Now, I said that the Russians are in the process of storming this um, Dacha district, the Zarya district on the railway. It seems that a unit is advancing let west from, Russian units advancing west from the railway in this general area and is in the process of advancing towards the village, the actual village of Novo Bakhmutivka, and is also seeking to cut the road between Novo Bakhmutivka and Berdichi further south. Now, the fighting for Berdichi has been continuous since October. The Russians some weeks ago, captured Stepove, Stepovye, the village to the east of Berdici. They appear to have captured some estimates, say 90% of Berdici, perhaps even more than that. Ukrainians still clinging on to a few buildings, apparently. Their main route of resupply is this road to Novo Bakhmutivka. If Novo Bakhmutivka is captured by the Russians, or if the road from Novo Bakhmutivka is cut, then the Ukrainians in Berdichi or near Berdichi are cut off from resupply by road. The fields apparently are still there, are still open. Um, they're getting harder. It might be easier to send machines and supplies across the fields, but of course fields are never as good for resupplying troops as a proper road. <laughs> and, well, frankly, it looks as if the Ukrainian troops in or near or to the north of Berdichi are now at serious risk of encirclement unless they withdraw. Something which, again, up to now, General Sirsky has been extremely unwilling to do. Now, just to say again, the advance towards Ocheretinje has been um, complemented by an advance by the Russians further east along the H-20 road. The Russians apparently now immediately to the east of the villages of Novo Kalinova and Keramik. It's not clear whether they're actually attacking these places. As I understand it, they probably are. But anyway, it looks as if the Ukrainian defences in this area are starting to crumble, to, to break down. And one of the most interesting facts is that, as I well remember, months ago when there was this bitter in counter battle for Stepovoy, um, east of Berdichi. There were lots of pictures of Ukrainian drone attacks on Russian soldiers. The Russians, of course, were launching drone attacks against the Ukrainians on their part, but there were lots of reports of Ukrainian drone attacks. And the 47th Mechanized Brigade, which was 
the elite brigade the Ukrainians had deployed to this area was very busy, as I remember, with the fighting around there and posting lots of pictures and films. I noticed that all of this has dwindled. It's basically run, basically stopped. And I wonder whether that's a sign that with Stepovoy firmly under Russian control, with the Russians having, in other words, gained um, permanent footholds west of the railway, they've now managed to deploy jamming equipment which has, in effect, effectively countered the Ukrainian FPV drones. And that's why we're not seeing them so active in this area and why the Russians are able to advance as rapidly as they apparently are. So, there we go. A complex battle. I don't know whether the troops who are Ukrainian troops who have been fighting near Berdichi or in Berdichi are still the 47th Mechanized Brigade. I presume that they are. But those troops now, or so it seems to me, at serious risk of encirclement. And I'm a little surprised that the Ukrainians haven't yet grasped that fact and pulled them back. Anyway, further west or further southwest, um, reports that the Russians have uh, assaulted Umanske and Yasnobrodovka and that they've cut the main road between Yasnobrodovka and Natalev Natalyevo, further to the south, Natalyevo being this village immediately to the west of Pervomaisky, which the Russians captured last week, and reports early this morning that the Russians have begun the assault the main assault on Netalevo, and are seeking to capture this village too. So, one way or the other, it does start to look as if this whole Ukrainian defence line west of um, of Devka is collapsing. Now, yesterday, I spoke about my confusion about the many reports of a mass desertion of troops by the 25th um, Airborne Brigade of the Ukrainian Army, which was supposedly fighting in this area, in the area west of Toninka, and um, whose surrender, or the surrender of some of whose units, supposedly led to the collapse of the Ukrainian defence lines um, west of Toninka, and to the arrival of the Russian troops before Umanske, Yasnobrodovka, and Italovo. Anyway, today there are reports that this entire brigade, the 25th um, Air Assault Brigade, has been disbanded by the Ukrainian military. But this is all very confusing because, as I said, the Russian Defense Ministry has only spoken about the sur surrender of nine soldiers if an entire brigade is being disbanded because apparently it is becoming increasingly insubordinate, well, of course, that is a sign of growing collapse, but it also appears to confirm the reports that I was talking about in my program yesterday that an entire battalion of that brigade appeared to have surrendered and given up the battle. Dima at the military summary channel is also talking about a decision by the Russian, by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, to disband another brigade. Um, this is the 67th Brig Brigade, which is in the Chasov Yar area. Unclear why that decision has been taken as well. Apparently, it's a brigade based on the right sector, ultra-nationalist, far-right political group. So you would suppose these are highly motivated fighters. Um, clearly, things are not going especially well. And 
bear in mind, 67th Brigade, apparently unhappy and restless, and therefore disbanded. The 3rd Assault Brigade, refusing orders to fight in Chasafia, according to reports. I wonder whether what is happening is that Wisuski now in command, he is insisting on these nationalist far-right units, the 3rd Assault Brigade, the 67th Brigade, actually participating in the battle. Um, General Zaluzhny, I was reliably informed by an indispensable source, always kept these elite units made of ultra-nationalist fighters in reserve to the extent that he could, far away from the battle, even though they apparently account for something like a quarter of the Ukrainian army. He did that because he shares their ideological beliefs and apparently sees these, saw these units as the core, the ideological and political core of the Ukrainian army, which had to be preserved. Anyway, it looks as if Sirsky has come in, has reversed that policy, is insisting that these troops must actually fight, is sending them to the front lines, and I wonder whether perhaps some of them are extremely angry and upset about that. This isn't what they expected at all, and that they're now pushing back, and that there's criticisms of Sirsky and presumably of Zelensky as well, and uh, this is why the 3rd Assault Brigade is refusing orders to be deployed to specific areas of the battlefronts, and this is why the 67th Brigade is now being disbanded. Anyway, these are only guesses. I don't know the full story. I don't think anybody outside the Ukrainian general staff and these units themselves actually does. But just to say again, if we start to get a pattern of surrenders and surrenders and refusals to obey orders from key Ukrainian military units at a time when the Russians are piling on the pressure, then I think we can start to talk about the beginning of the end. I'm not quite sure that we are there. I'm not quite sure that this is what is actually taking place. But if whole brigades are now starting to resist orders, defy orders, and if their units, elite units and paratroopers, presumably our elite troops, are starting to engage in mass surrenders, then it does look as if the Ukrainian army is starting to become spent. For the record, one of um, Denis Bushilin's many advisors, Denis Bushilin being, of course, the head of the Ukrainian, of the sort of the Don, Donetsk regional government, which is a Russian official. Um, anyway, one of these advisors, one of Bushilin's advisors, I forget which one has actually now come forward and said that nearly all the troops that are fighting on the front lines from the Ukrainian army are recently mobilised and untrained, and that this is having a significant effect on the conduct of operations. That perhaps explains why Sirsky is having to call on these nationalist units and it also perhaps explains, given the realities on the battlefronts, why they're unhappy about that. Anyway, that's the situation in general in the Avdevka area. Lots of more reports of intense fighting just to the south of the Avdevka area in Krasnogorovka. I've already discussed how the supply roads to Krasnogorovka are gradually being cut. The Russians have apparently managed to increase the area in Krasnogorovka that they control. The major story about Krasnogorovka continues to be the intense Russian bombing, aircraft and helicopter gunships 
see pictures coming from Krasnogorovka with re- constant huge explosions on Ukrainian positions there. And I'm frankly getting the sense that before long, <laughs> and suddenly, we're going to see a collapse of Ukrainian resistance in Krasnogorovka as well. I would not be surprised if at some point over the next few weeks we get reports that Krasnogorovka and Chasovya, resistance in both of these places, has collapsed at roughly the same time. So, a disastrous situation on the battlefronts, and I've not even talked in this programme about the Russian bombing and missile strikes, the collapse of Ukraine's energy system, the desperate shortage of air defence missiles, and all of those things. But an irreversible trend towards military defeat and collapse. There's been, in Germany, an article in Berliner Zeitung, which is a Berlin-based newspaper, saying that people in Germany need to face reality that Ukraine is losing the war and that talk about Ukraine recovering its lost territories and of the Russians pulling out of Ukraine, as Chancellor Scholz still insists, um, is just so much pie in the sky and needs to be abandoned. I have to say Berliner Zeitung is an unusual newspaper in Germany. It's, it was previously an East German newspaper. It was reconstituted after the fall of the wall and has achieved a wider readership in Berlin specifically. I'm not sure that it is an especially influential newspaper, however. But a newspaper which in its home country is extremely news influential is the New York Times. And there has been one of the most intelligent and sane articles about the state of the conflict by any Western politician in that I have seen to date, appearing in the New York Times. And this has been written by, um, um, by um, J.D. Vance. And um, it's an article that perhaps ought to have been written some time ago. Um, it's um, astonishing that it has taken so long. But J.D. Vance makes the obvious point that if you look at the situation in Ukraine, claims of victory and success don't make sense. They don't add up. And in fact, he says this, the math on Ukraine doesn't add up. And he then goes on to say, President Biden wants the world to believe that the biggest obstacle facing Ukraine is Republicans and our lack of commitment to the global community. This is wrong. Ukraine's challenge is not the GOP, it's math. Ukraine needs more soldiers that it can field, even with draconian conscription policies, and it needs more material than the United States can provide. The reality must inform any future Ukraine policy, from further congressional aid to the diplomatic course set by the president. And he then goes on to say, the most fundamental question, how much does Ukraine need and how much can we actually provide? Um, Mr. Biden suggests that a $60 billion supplemental means the difference between victory and defeat in a major war between Russia and Ukraine. This is wrong. $60 billion is a fraction of what it would take to turn the tide in Ukraine's fa- favour. But this is not just a matter of dollars. Fundamentally, we lack the capacity to manufacture the amount of weapons Ukraine needs us to supply to win the war. war. Consider our ability to produce 150 millimeter artillery shells. Last year, Ukraine's then defense minister assessed that their baseline requirement 
for these shells is over 4 million per year. The United States, for the record, has never managed to supply more than 1 million shells in any particular year, but said that they could fire up to 7 million shells if that many were available. Since the start of the conflict, the United States has gone to great lengths to ramp up production of 155 millimeter shells. We've roughly doubled our capacity and can now produce 360,000 per year, less than a tenth of what Ukraine says it needs. The administration's goal is to get this to 1.2 million, 30% of what's needed by the end of 2025. This would cost the American taxpayer dearly whilst yielding an unpleasantly, fami un unpleasantly familiar result. Failure abroad. And he then refers to General Cavoli, who's recently told Congress that the situation in Ukraine is becoming desperate, that the Ukrainians will soon be at, at a 10 to 1 artillery disadvantage over the Russians, which is true. And um, he also then discusses the situation with Patriot systems. He said, the story is the same when we look at our other munitions, take the Patriot missile system, our premier air defense weapon. It's of such importance in this war that Ukraine's foreign minister has specifically demanded them. That's because in March alone, Russia reportedly launched over 3,000 guided aerial bombs, 600 drones, and 400 missiles at Ukraine. The problem is this. The United States only manufactures 550 Patriot missiles every year. If we pass the supplemental aid package currently being considered in Congress, we could potentially increase annual production to 650, but that's still less than a third of what Ukraine requires. These weapons are not only needed by Ukraine. If China were to set its sights on Taiwan, the Patriot missile system would be critical to its defense. In fact, the United States has promised to send Taiwan nearly $900 million worth of Patriot missiles, but delivery of these systems and other essential resources has been severely delayed, partly because of shortages caused by the war. If that sounds bad, consider Ukraine's manpower situation is even worse. Here are the basics. Russia has nearly four times the population of Ukraine. Ukraine needs upward of half a million new rec recruits, but hundreds of thousands of fighting men have already fled the country. And after two years of conflict, there are some villages with almost no men left. The Ukrainian military has resorted to coercing men into service, and women have staged protests to demand the return of their husbands and fathers after long years of service at the front. And as he correctly says, the basic mathematical result realities are true. Uh, uh, are uncontestable, Ukraine cannot win this war. It cannot achieve the objectives of victory that its supporters insist upon. He suggests as an alternative that other mythological option that Ukraine go on to the defence and build fortified lines, which Ukraine, by the way, is trying to build and tries to hold out, though he does make clear that this is something that should be done in conjunction with a diplomatic strategy to end the war. In other words, very belatedly and far too late, he's come round to the position outlined by George Beebe and Jim Webb back in August. As I said, it's too late for that now. But in terms of military objectives, Ukraine simply cannot regain its lost territory. No one who looks at the facts, considers the figures, believes that it can. Now, this is irrefutable. It's a relief to find 
someone in a senior political position at last saying this. Um, we have, as I said, absurd statements still being made by people like Olaf Scholz, that he won't speak to Putin until Putin withdraws all Russian troops from Ukraine, which means that he will never speak to Putin again. He's just, by the way, arrived in China, where his plane arrived, touched down in Chongqing, and the Chinese authorities sent the deputy mayor to meet him, not even the mayor or the local governor or anything of that kind. Hardly what you might call an effusive welcome. But anyway, that's Olaf Scholz's problem. Um, so um, we come up with these absurd comments from Western officials and Western political leaders. It's a relief to find that there is someone in authority, a political, a politician, somebody who holds important elected office in the United States, who is able to do the sums. <laughs> and the sums tell their own story. It has to be said that J.D. Vance's comments have not been entirely welcomed. I'm not going to read the whole article, but we've had a counter-article against him appearing in National Review. Its title says it all. J.D. Vance's logic of surrender. And we're also told that if J.D. Vance has lost faith in America, well, that doesn't mean that all Americans should. So he looks at the facts. He talks about ammunition problems, Patriot missile problems, and his critics talk about surrender and faith, faith in America and its ability to achieve presumably anything. Some months ago, <laughs> the Wall Street Journal talked about magical thinking in Ukraine. It's shattering that when someone like J.D. Vance simply sets it out as it is, as it so obviously is, as I and others, Vashinin, Baletic, so many people have been saying for so many months, years now, when someone like J.D. Vance comes out and says it, we see the critics again retreat into magical thinking. It's, it's losing faith in America. It's surrender. It's appeasement of the dictator. It's Neville Chamberlain all over again. We must um, find the will to turn things around. If the will is there... The means will be there. Don't talk to me about factories and logistics and shell production and Patriot missile production and things of that kind. We must keep going until, until what exactly? Until Ukraine is completely destroyed, until the Russians control every square millimeter of it, until the French go into Ukraine and get smashed and turn to the Americans and beg for help, and the Americans probably refuse, until what exactly, what has to happen before the simple logic of someone like J.D. Vance, based on facts, actual facts, not aspirations, not faith, <laughs> is accepted and decisions start to be made based on realities. Now, to reiterate again, Vladimir Putin has talked about an Istanbul Plus type potential outcome. I'm not sure to what extent he believes in it, by the way, but that's what he said. He said, if people want to talk to us, we're prepared to revisit Istanbul, the agreement that was reached in draft in April of 2022. Of course, a lot has changed since then. The new agreement must reflect the existing realities. 
the territories that are now part of Russia, as we believe the four regions plus Crimea, that fact has to be recognized. There probably need to be other things added to it as well. Unlikely we can agree that with Zelensky, and most probably he will have to go. But at least Putin, for the moment, is talking about something like that. But I come back to what Russia's ambassador, Vasily Nebenziev, said to the Security Council. Before long, the only subject of international conferences will be the question of Ukraine's unconditional surrender. That's the mailed fist in this increasingly threadbare velvet glove that the Russians are still holding out to us. And, well, I've done only a brief summary today of the military situation. We see how bad the situation is becoming in Chasovia. We see how bad the situation is becoming in Avdeevka. We see how bad the situation is becoming in Krasnogorovka. We see that the Russians have put together a new battle group, a uh, group of forces, Sever, perhaps to capture Kharkov. We see how most of Ukraine, its thermal power stations are being destroyed. Its infrastructure is collapsing. We see all of these things. Surely, that day, when the Russians only talk about unconditional surrender because there is nothing else to talk about is getting closer so national review can talk about no surrender they can talk about not losing faith in america but all that they're doing it seems to me is setting up the west for an even greater geopolitical defeat and disaster and are killing many more Ukrainians along the way and are preparing for the collapse or are preparing the ground for the collapse of Ukraine. It astonishes me still that this kind of nihilistic thinking has taken so much hold over the imagination of our leaders. It's an enormous relief, as I said, to find at least one leader, because J.D. Vance, in a kind of a way, he is a leader. Being a senator in the United States is a position of electoral and political importance, and J.D. Vance is clearly a rising star. It is a relief to find one <laughs> leader who is not trapped in this mysticism and magical thinking and fantasizing any longer. It's also deeply alarming that so far he is one of so very few. Well, I finish my program at this point today. No doubt more. Over the next couple of days, we will see whether or not the Israelis do act, or rather we will see what form the action they're bound, all but bound to take. We'll see what it amounts to. In the meantime, let me remind you that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also check out our shop and find all our amazing things there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. Remember, you can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.